Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is Congressman Tim Burchett. Congressman, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, ma'am, for having me. It is a real honor. And we, it is a real honor to be talking to you. And we have a really important conversation on immigration, on border security. This week, as you know, the House voted against impeaching DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas and the bipartisan border security bill failed in the Senate. But before we dive into all of that, you actually visited the border before. So could you tell us a little bit about your experience, what you saw there, and probably most importantly, what you believe is missing from the national conversation regarding border security and immigration? Yes, ma'am. Well, I I went down to the border and um, I, I, I told them I didn't want to do the, you know, the, the photo op and all of the all the other nonsense. I, I said, I want to go down and um, flew down one night, and I said the next day, full day on the border, and then I flew back to Tennessee on the net, and, you know, so it was really a three-day trip, I guess, um, uh, one day on the ground at the border, and then flew home the next day, because uh, I, I really didn't care for all the press conference stuff. I just wanted to see it for myself. And uh, Andy Biggs put that together out of Arizona, and so we uh, we went to the border. We saw it all. We saw the you know all the stuff on the the razor wire and the and the um, uh, storage containers that Texas had put up and talked to a lot of very discouraged uh, um, law enforcement, border patrol, and but I, you know I had a different experience. I don't uh, when the cameras get away from you, you know you can kind of you can kind of wander probably where you're not supposed to be. But I saw this family. They just come over the border, um, walked across the Rio Grande there at one point. Some people swam. It, you know, there's areas of it. I mean, it's a it's pretty much an open sewer, unfortunately. And uh, and they had this. There's a family there, and they were holding their little girl. And they had a little boy. And um, and I, see, I married my wife. My wife was a widow, Navy widow, and um, uh, and I adopted her little girl, and she's wonderful. <laughs> she's wonderful, man. She's she is a special little girl. I'm so fortunate, and um, she's a whole lot like her mama. And uh, but the little girl was about the same age of my Isabel when I started dating her mama, and she was older. Her. She was probably uh, four, five, six, or something because they were a short family. So the little girl was little bitty, and I put my hand on her little shoulder, and I said, "Hola," and um, and the the uh, Border Patrol said, Congressman, she doesn't, she probably doesn't speak English. And I said, well, brother, a lot of people would question whether I speak English as well. And she smiled at me and I just kept thinking, you know, this little girl is the same age as my Isabel when I got her. And I said, uh, and I got to think, and I guess God spoke to me. I, you know, I say he speaks to me, just not in an audible voice. You know, he didn't say, Tim, do something about the board, you know, uh, but he, um, I said, you know, I need to do something about this. And uh, and I thought, man, we're the greatest dadgum country on God's green earth. We can do better than this, and we should. And so I started digging into it, um, and I'm trying to develop businesses that Americans possibly create a incentive-type thing where they can invest in these countries where we know these folks are coming from the vast majority of them, I mean, you got the cartels and they're dirtbags and we need to send them to hell as quick as possible. But the vast majority of these people are just trying to get a better life for their families. And I, you know, and I, I take an oath to uphold the constitution, the laws of this country. And I, you know, they're here illegally, don't get me wrong. And they need to be stopped and we need to send them home. But the problem is that it's just not gonna, it's just not happening in this environment. So I'm trying to create a way, and I call it demagnetizing, because you saw in New York last week where they put $53 million into credit cards to issue to people that are here illegally. You know, Dad Gummit, all that's going to do is bring them up there, magnetize them. And then California giving them free health care. I mean, somebody's got to pay for all this stuff. But you know, capitalism outside of Christianity, I feel like it's the greatest. It's done more for people than anything outside of Christianity. And we could start exporting capitalism. And there's uh, there's some, I'm, I'm working with some folks in my area 
to develop these businesses down there and then they can sell their products to America. And that, because if those people will make around $5,000 a year, you know, dad gun, they'll stay in their own countries, $5,000. And so I'm trying to, I'm looking at it from a different angle and I don't, and I blame the Democrats. I mean, I blame Biden, you know, he's got his head in the sand on this thing. All he's doing is, is I think, I think you've got a lot of people that are truly anarchists. They want to destroy this country and, um, and everything it stands for. I think some people got his ear that truly want to do that. And that's in the way they're going to do that is, is just overwhelm every social system we have in this country. And two, I feel like with mail-in ballots, there's very little credibility on this thing. Um, I just, I just have a lot of bad feelings about this thing. So, um, that and and but I but I don't particularly blame the Democrats or the Republicans. Who I blame? We've got these national chambers of commerce who are involved in this latest um, negotiations out of the Senate, which to me were not in a big negotiation. You're going to say, if you have five thousand encounters, they shut the border down at that point. Nobody else gets to come. Well, how are they going to stop them? They can't stop them now. So if you're telling me four thousand nine hundred and ninety nine, it's okay. But at 5,000, we're going to stop. No, these people are here illegally. You've got to stop it. But we got to look at it a different way. And I, you know, like down in Guatemala, they're, they're having a hard time finding working age men and women now because guess what? They're all coming up here. And so we've got to change the narrative. We got to put our heads together. And, um, uh, you know, I think what's going on right now is just a bunch of nonsense. It's election year. Biden knows the polls are showing. I mean, you have Democrat mayors and governors, for goodness sakes, who are condemning him. And, you know, the fentanyl I was I met with in Washington this past week, and I'll wrap this part up. I'm sorry I'm talking so long. I've had too much coffee this morning. But the um, I met with the narcotics officers, and they said just about 100% of it is coming over our southern border. It's produced in China. It's sent over our southern border fentanyl. Fentanyl is killing thousands of people. I met with a girl that went to my high school, Bearden High School. She was a couple years younger than me and her son took some fentanyl unbeknownst to him. He overdosed, of course, and died. And it's just time and time again. It's everywhere. We're all border we're all border states now because of this thing. Congressman, I really appreciate you providing the human element of this crisis for us. And before we get to the stories of the week regarding this, whether it be Mayorkas or that bipartisan border bill, you offered a unique solution here of um, investing in businesses in other countries to, as what you described, demagnetize the issue. Have you talked to any of your colleagues about this type of solution? And could we see, see this soon? Could Americans expect this? Yes, ma'am, I have. Um, but let's just be honest. The corrupt nature of Washington D.C. it's it's not a it's not a swamp, ma'am. A swamp is something pretty cool. It's a cool little ecosystem created by God. Washington D.C. is an open sewer. It is created by man. I mean, it all just flows in and nothing flows out, and that's really what it is. Both parties are infected by this, and um, again, it's the uniparty. You close the doors. You don't see black, white, or brown. You see, you see green, the color of money. And, uh, and you know, when you propose something like this, everybody scrambles and tries to uh, figure out how they can cash in on it. And I just, I'm just disgusted with our system. I'm disgusted with the fact that when we, you know, we gave $114 billion basically unchecked to Ukraine, and then we, um, we gave them our missile defense system, and then we had to replenish ours, which we should, um, and then you saw both members of both parties were were invested in these missile defense companies. I mean, that's just that's the tip of the iceberg. And everybody wants to blast Pelosi for, you know, Speaker Pelosi for how much, you know, she's made 30, 40 percent return or whatever it is. But I mean, there's people making heck. She's at the if you look at the scale, I mean, she's in the middle. And, you know, there's a people percentage wise, you know, I, my buddy Tommy Siler down here on Gay Street, he manages my $7,000 portfolio of, of mutual fund. <laughs> you know, we ought to make everybody put everything in a mutual fund. I mean, this it's so crooked, uh, you know, and nobody cares. It's just, it's just part of the, 
doing business. It's not the way I do business, but unfortunately, that's what we're at. And I, when you propose something like this, it never goes anywhere, prop, and unless somebody can figure out a way they can cash in, and that's that's disgusting. But um, you know, it's kind of what I run against and I run up against every time. So, but I'm going to keep pushing because I haven't been able to get much much leverage with it, much talk about it. Congressman, it's really interesting to hear you talk about influence, and I want to pivot just a second here. As you know, the bipartisan border bill did fail in the Senate, but House Republicans did say if it comes to the House, it's dead on arrival. They were criticized that people have said that's because President Trump was against this bill, as well as they didn't want to give President Biden a win on immigration, a hotly contested issue during an election year. Is there any truth to that? No, ma'am, I don't think there is. We'd already been leaked. Um, we'd already been leaked pretty much the, a lot of the detail, the bill, the 5,000 people coming over. I mean, that's a non, that's a no starter right there. And then of course we're hiring more bureaucrats, more lawyers to do all this. You know, it, it, just what part of this white house do they not understand that these folks are here illegally? And so you're going to put in a document that up to 5,000, they're legal, you know, and then and they're allowed in, which which gives them a, a leak, I guess, a, a legal stance. And to me, that just, that's a non-starter right there. And they told Trump he couldn't have $4 billion to build a wall because they said it would break us. And then we'd throw $114 billion at Ukraine, plus everything else we're giving them. And, you know, we're just, we're in every war around the world. And yet we can't secure our own southern border. To me, that's just a, that's just nonsense. And the American public sees it, and that's why you're seeing the president now talking. He's trying to blame Trump. Trump just said it was a bad bill. Blame him for it because he knows how bad it is. Uh, you know, he's he's not following the traditional narrative that that the media is putting out, and that's why he he defies their odds all the time. And that's why, you know, he will be the Republican Party nominee. Sir, based on your reaction here, it does sound like you are happy the bill did fail in the Senate, but I am curious, that was a bipartisan bill. Why is no bill better than this compromise? Well, because you start out by allowing 5,000 folks over the border, cost $118 billion, and it's not a border bill. A $60 billion of it goes to Ukraine right out the bat. The largest single one shot goes to Ukraine. And... Um, and we that's going to be a never ending war and and yeah there again you've got the industrial war complex it's got their fingers all over it they're all these these, these liberal economists are saying well half the money's coming back to america buying guns and buying arms you know these are people supposed to be against war and as, if that was the case just write just write these companies a check for 60 billion or 70 billion dollars and that way nobody dies you know i, I just don't see the the rationale in all this, it's, it's, um, it's a lot of, you know, again, a lot of the big boys, the uniparty has their fingers on this thing. And, um, you know, daddy used to say, daddy was no world war two veteran Marine Corps. He used to say, old men make decisions, young men die. And I'm afraid we're, we're, we're rapidly approaching that. We can't seem to keep our fingers out of any war in this world right now. To your point, this bill did provide $60 billion to Ukraine. Are you against Ukraine funding full stop? Or are you against this much funding? Full stop. I don't believe I've ever voted for a one red cent for them. I, again, most people couldn't find Ukraine on a map. Russia, and I don't like Putin. I, they need, I, I, he's, he's, a, he's a thug. I mean, he's a KGB thug is all he is. He's probably murdered people. He's not... Hey, I'm not a pro-Putin person. This doesn't have anything about Putin. Um, you know, why are we not attacking China? They 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 put the poor Uyghurs in um, in concentration camps, probably organ harvesting and everything else. They're just despicable people. Yet, yet we want their we want their goods, their trade. Once again, the National Chamber of Commerce, um, which has nothing to do with commerce, actually is more of a political wing, especially after they endorsed, I believe, 14 of Nancy Pelosi's lieutenants in Congress. Um, now, this is, uh, we need to, we, 
Russia's GDP is somewhere between China's and France's. I mean, for goodness sakes, they're not, it's not our war. We, we've got so much more. We've got a border that's, we've, you know, we've had over 10 million people in the last three years come over our border, southern border. In, they've invaded us, literally. The largest single group that's coming over now, I was told yesterday, <clears throat> is, is Chinese. What the heck are they doing here? And, and, and if we go to war with one of, say, if, if Taiwan, if China moves on Taiwan, what are those thousands of people here going to be doing? Whose side are they going to be on? I think we better we better reevaluate this thing. We've been briefed by some former uh, heads of major security agencies in our country and said we are we are looking at a possible 9/11 type situation, multiple 9/11 situation. These people are all over our country. I mean, it's wide open. I live here in Knoxville, Tennessee, ma'am. TVA dams are just you can walk right up to them. Somebody could go up to one of them with a John boat full of explosives and you and it, it could really do a lot of damage to the valley and you 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 multiply that around the, all 48 of our contiguous states it could be some devastation could happen I do want to get back to the Ukraine funding. I know Republican senators have said if the United States doesn't fund Ukraine, doesn't help them in this war and Russia steamrolls them, that could be a World War III. So what's your reaction to that? It could already be a World War III. We've, we've shown our enemies. We, we have no guts. We've shown our allies. We don't support them. Um, you know the Middle East is a is a tender box. I don't I don't see Putin and 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 Russia starting World War Three. Um, yeah, I hate it for the people of Ukraine. I hope they win, but we've got no plan over there. And you know what's going to happen after it's over with, regardless who the victor is, America will be back over there rebuilding, and again, and our military complex will will be thriving. You, you, your Pentagon, our Pentagon, has not passed an audit in the history of audits. Never. They have. They cannot account for over a half a trillion dollars in their assets. A half a trillion. And yet, how do we punish them this last um, NDAA? We gave them, I believe, 20 billion additional new dollars this year. Uh, you know, it's just never ending, ma'am. We cannot keep, we, we're borrowing money to fight a proxy war. And that that just doesn't ever end well. A standalone bill to help fund Israel also failed in the House this week, as you know. What's your reaction to that? Well, it failed because it didn't have any offsets. And offsets are if you're going to spend the money here, you cut it out of somewhere else. We passed it once before, and we offset it with um, uh, the money from um, um the IRS. That was the first attempt. Uh, you know, the Senate refuses to take any of this stuff up. A clean bill to me is the way to go. I, I don't, I, I don't like spending money we don't have. But I quit, quit tying it. I, I love standalone bills. In Tennessee, you cannot pass anything. It has to fit within the caption. So you can't have, say, a, a bill dealing with a nursing homes and stick a pay raise in there for legislators. And that's why Tennessee is a balanced budget state. I, I propose similar legislation in Washington. I propose legislation that shows a fiscal note or a physical note, if you're from the rural areas, um, a fiscal note with the bills and they have to announce how much each of them costs. They don't go anywhere because the big boys love these multi-spending bills so they can pack on their little pet projects, their bridges to nowhere, so to speak, and um, and that's why we're we're thirty five trillion dollars in debt, man. We take in five trillion dollars a year and spend seven trillion dollars a year, and both parties do it. The Democrats do it with social plans, you know. We do it with with defense spending plans. We just we just cannot control it. We cannot control ourselves. And I wish I wish the voters would start paying more attention to their legislators and their their incredible spending of a lot of these people that you see on the national news and things and both parties are like they claim to be fiscal giants in reality they tack on a lot of their stuff 
on the backside of these big bills. Congressman, I do now want to pivot to a resolution that ultimately failed in the House earlier this week, and that is the impeachment of DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Give us your reaction. Well, I was disappointed. Um, some people said they don't have any grounds to, but ma'am, lying under oath is grounds. That's what they got Nixon on. You know, they didn't convict him of a crime. He lied under oath. And that's exactly what my orcas has done. Every time he gets up and holds up his hand in one of these hearings or what have you and says, we don't have a problem at the border. And our border is, is secure. People are not coming over the border. That is just a lie. And he knows it and he's allowed to say it because the national media will not call him out because they have so much invested in this White House. And, it, and, and the American public's not buying it. So we had three folks that, that, and, you know, I, I'm not knocking them. I'm just telling you what I believe. And, um, and you know, our whip team, we thought we had the votes. They brought Al Green in in a wheelchair. Um, we have a one-person majority. You saw our former speaker who decided to leave early and kind of left us in a bad spot. Um, I guess to become a lobbyist, you have a year-long cooling-off period or whatever. And so... He got a jump on that. And then you saw another one, another one of our members become a university president. So Speaker Johnson has a, you know, one person majority. And we thought we had it. And I think they'll bring it up again next week. I think we'll have the votes then to do that. But will it go anywhere in the Senate? Probably not. Not it won't. <laughs> but and people in your next question would be, why don't why do we do that then? Because the American public demands it. We should. We need to. We need to not react to the Senate. We need to do our own business, and um, and 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 that's what our base is demanding right now. The, uh, people are, and and it's not so much our base even anymore. Moderates are saying, "Man, we got to do something about this border situation." Now, your hardcore liberal, liberals and your Marxists that are openly. Um, indoctrinating our kids and stuff on these college campuses, um, they're never going to be there. But the rank and file Americans, I can assure you, think we need to do something about this border. And this, and, the, and Mayorkas is the one who's really um, thumbing his nose at the American people. Congressman, I've had the privilege to talk to your colleagues throughout the last year and a half, both on the left and the right. And everyone I have talked to when the border comes up has said there is a crisis at the southern border, whether they be a Democrat or Republican. Obviously, as you know, the solution to fix that problem differs depending on what party you're in. But one of your Republican colleagues who voted against Mayorkas's impeachment, Congressman Tom McClintock, said this, quote, this border crisis cannot be fixed by replacing one left-wing official with another. So to his point, how does impeaching Mayorkas make America more safe if he's just going to be replaced by another person supporting the Biden administration? It shows the American people that we're going to hold people accountable. They can't just get up there and take these high-profile, high-paying jobs and just lie to the American public. To me, Tom's a buddy of mine. He's from California. You know, I'm from East Tennessee, ma'am. It's... Um, uh, you know, a lot of my constituents are formerly his constituents. Uh, they've left California um, because they can't stand it. And yeah, he's got to vote. He's got to vote his conscience. I'm not knocking him. I'm just telling you, my vote is is because my orcas lied under oath to us, and that's inexcusable. He can make a mistake, but he he's made that mistake over and over and over again. And it's time to be held accountable. This is this is a product of the everybody gets a trophy generation. And, um, and nobody's to blame for what they've done. Eventually, somebody's got to be accountable. He is the head of Homeland Security. And right now, ma'am, our homeland is not very secure. You mentioned earlier you think there's going to be a vote on this next week. How confident are you that the outcome's going to change? What's going to be the difference here? I feel like it'll happen. But again, you know, all this is a diversion. Um, I, I concentrate a lot on my constituent service. Now, we've created an incredible success pool up here at Sewer, and uh, the average citizen has a real trouble getting through it, whether they're veterans or, or disability or just whatever. 
you know, some some uh, crack house is operating next to somebody's house. And who do they call? They call me. Because I'll call somebody and we'll get it we'll get it re resolved, whether it's state, federal, or local. So I, you know, I, I go and do the votes and do my thing, and I issue my disgust on my Twitter account at Tim Burchett or X, excuse me, the X. Um, but I have, um, you know, I, I don't I don't lose any sleep over this stuff. You did mention um, Speaker McCarthy, not by name, uh, earlier that he left Congress. I am curious, how confident are you in the new speaker, Speaker Mike Johnson's leadership? The impeachment vote failed. The standalone Israel vote failed. What do you make of his leadership? He is, he doesn't use the carrot or the stick, ma'am. He, and that's what I like about the Republican Party or the Republican caucus. We're not going to vote lockstep. I've had to I look up there several times and there's eight or nine red dots on the board and I happen to be one of them. And, um, and I don't, you know, I, I, we're independent thinkers. I've seen multiple times, multiple times there'd be key votes and there'd be a Democrat holdout and you'd see the speaker and the speaker uh, Pelosi and Steny Hoyer and, and the other Democrats convalescing around that poor person. And I, you know, they're using the, the stick and they're telling them, you know, you want that bridge project, you want this, you want to stay on this committee. And, or they're saying, um, you know, Hey, if you'll do this, we'll, we'll reward you or whatever, you know, and we need you, we'll, we'll protect you, you know, and all this stuff. And so we don't, you don't see, um, you don't see Mike Johnson out there twisting arms. I, I think he's a he's a very decent person. He did not create this problem, ma'am. Our former speaker had been there, what, 20-something years or whatever. Mike's been there eight or nine or ten, I guess. But, you know, he didn't create this problem. He's inherited it. He has a one-person majority. You got some, you got very liberal folks. You got very conservative folks like myself. And you got the moderates in the middle that kind of, like amoebas, they just kind of go one way or the other, whichever their heart River, which way their heart tells them. So he has a very, very tough job. Probably the toughest, uh, toughest speaker position in the history of this country with a one person majority. And it's, uh, and you know, and he's taken the spears and arrows. I've never seen attacks on a guy's family. You know, he's adopted a kid and, or taken a kid in and they're, people were critical of that. And they, they've gone and interviewed his old girlfriends and stuff. I mean, this guy, he is a, he's a straight arrow. I tweeted, when he first got elected, I said, uh, or we elected him speaker, I said, he loves, he loves America, he loves his wife, and he loves Jesus. I said, this guy scares me or something like that. You know, I was, I was being sarcastic, of course, because, you know, he's being attacked, but this guy's clean, and, um, and, he, and he works very hard, and he's conscientious of it. He's in a very tough position, so I, I'm not a golfer, but I, I give him a couple of mulligans because he's, you know, and I, but I think the trouble the conservative movement has, as it's always had, you know, they elect Ronald Reagan and then they stop. They elect Donald Trump and then they stop. And, you know, realize you've got Congress, you've got Senate, you've got school board races, you've got city councils, you've got county commissions, mayors, things like that. Uh, and, and they always forget. And the liberals don't. They get it. They're... They're working around the clock. They're, you know, here in Knoxville, Tennessee, we have an openly Marxist member of city council. Right? In Knoxville, Tennessee, man, my hometown. And, you know, we're a university town. We're going to get these, we're going to get a lot of liberals. I get that. But they're never sleeping. And, um, and I'm afraid the conservatives do, and they get their feelings hurt, just like this last presidential election. 20 million so-called conservatives decided to stay home or listen to the view as their political um, consultants. And that's how we got Joe Biden in the White House. And I always, they say, well, they stole the election. I say, buddy, I said, brother, we got to put enough points on the board where they can't steal it. We got to get people to the polls. And I just don't think the conservatives understand that. Congressman, my last question for you. First, to your point, I wouldn't wish the job of speaker on anyone, especially after what we saw the past year. 
But after these votes came out, not in the favor of Republicans, the headlines were abound of this is embarrassing for the Republican Party. The GOP is in disarray. Um, they wanted a fix on the border and then they reject it. What do you make of those criticisms? What's your response to that? Oh, that's not accurate, ma'am. We we are organized. We already sent H.R. 2 over to the House and the media refuses to bring that up. That would have solved a lot of our border problem, our border crisis. H.R. 2 was passed months ago and it's sitting on um, the Speaker of the Senate's desk and, and he refused refuses to do anything with it. Yet nobody in the media refers to that. Nobody refers to the disarray in the Democrat Party that they're afraid to bring something like that up. So I'd submit to you, ma'am, that's just that's that's just liberal talking points. And and uh, I don't I don't see the disarray. Yeah, there are people who are upset, but Republicans feel more free to talk about it than Democrats do because they're not afraid of leadership coming and taking their committee position or taking a, a pork project out of their district. So I I. I submit to you, ma'am, that's that's a falsehood. And and to think that Trump, you know, is calling the shots um, on on all these little bills to me is is ridiculous. He just states his opinion as an American and you feel free to agree with him or disagree, but you know, on the on the border issue, Trump was uh, he got out. I mean, we'd already Mike Johnson already said it's dead on arrival a couple of weeks before President Trump, and then all of a sudden this is a perfect example, all of a sudden the media is saying Trump's calling the shots, Trump's killing the border deal, and that just is not true. To your point on HR2, it did pass the House, but without any Democratic support. The border bill that uh, the Senate brought up just this week had bipartisan support. So what do you say to voters who think that House Republicans can't compromise with Democrats on this issue? Because the Democrats don't want they don't want, they want all these voters coming in, ma'am. They, that just swells their roles and they know it. Um, elections are dirty business. It, it, politics is a contact sport. They want those folks doing their mail-in ballots. We don't do, do it like that in Tennessee, but these other states, it's just kind of a, they, they write their election laws in, in pencil because they, they erase it a lot and change their laws um, without without the proper approval of their state legislatures. So I, you know, I, I don't have a lot of faith in all that. I just, um, I just, um, I'm just glad I'm from Tennessee. Congressman, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate the long conversation. You're welcome back anytime. Ma'am, it has been my honor. Thank you so much.